hoping that someone's going to give me the the big nod to say that they can see my screen. David, can you give me the thumbs up that you, or Kate, you can see that? All right. Let me just move my, um, let's see if I can, Never mind. I seem to have all of your faces in front of my screen, but that's, I think I can So Maura, if you go to the right hand corner, you've got a little image that says speaker view or gallery view. Ah, uh, yeah. There so if you click on. Uh, that's okay. That's fine. I can manage for that. That's great. All right. So, so the topic tonight that, that I was going to explore with you is, is about really just a whole lot of key tips that I found to be so useful in creating thriving and abundant permaculture gardens. So I live in a place called Crystal Waters, which many of you might have heard of, um, but I'll just let you know a bit. So I have, um, I'm have i in an eco village, which is 650 acres of, of land up in the very headwaters of um, the Mary River, um, near the town of Conondale, just past Mullaney. And this eco village has been here for over 25 years. And um, it's been awarded the United Nations World Habitat Award for demonstrating sustainable low impact ways of living. That was maybe 20 odd years ago now. So I've been, I've been here for 20 years and before that um, I was helping to um, create a place called Northeast Street City Farm in Brisbane, which many of you might have heard of as well. Um, so permaculture has pretty much been my entire life and I, I haven't really ever had like a real job. I've, <laughs> I've always, permaculture has always been my work and my life and my love. And um, wherever I go, I'm always learning. Every time I visit a new place or a new community or a new village, I learn something new about um, plants or the soil or a way to prepare food or a way to think differently. I love that idea of having different perspectives on things. So, so th what I'm going to share with you is, is kind of like my 12, 12 key tips for, for helping to create abundance in the garden. Uh, so let me see if I can make sure I can, here we go. So the first point is really to diversify. You know, the, the idea of creating resilient gardens is in the, in the foundation of how diverse it is. And so within a permaculture garden, and as Kate said, a permaculture garden is around perm permanent culture as much as it is permanent agriculture. And it's, it's actually about trying to create like permanent food systems rather than constant annual gardens. It's really looking at how can you create beautiful polycultural gardens that act as if they're, they're like a forest but, uh, or a natural ecological system, but they have their edible components. So there's herbs and fruits and vegetables and um, all sorts of perennials and root crops and vines and uh, mulch plants, all sorts of things, all integrated in together. So this is a part of my looking out from my um, veranda, looking out into the vegetable garden that you can see there. And so every day there's something different. And I, I love just going out and exploring what is it that's, that's available to eat today. And, and my, my menu is determined by what's flourishing in the garden rather than trying to think, okay, well, I'm going to have these recipes and, and then try and grow for that. It's, I always try and look to what are the easiest things and the most, um, the things that belong in this area and the things that work with the, the seasons and the climate. And if it's a drought year, I grow different things as well. So different things flourish at different times. And because of the diversity in the flowers, there's always something there for the pollinators and the birds and there's habitat for all different sorts of things as well. I'm just trying to work out my little system of how to connect. All right, it's a mouse. So the, the basis of all of this really is about creating beautiful soil. Now, earlier today, uh, I was on, I, I mentor um, a group of young, uh, they're about somewhere between the ages of 10 to 15 and they're refugees in a camp in Uganda, refugees from the Congo. And every week I get online with them and we do this mentoring uh, system. And today the focus was about soil life. And it was a fascinating conversation because it reminded me how often we think, 
you know, the way that we think of soil is it's just kind of a receptacle for the plants to go in or to put compost on and then that's what feeds the plants. And we forget that it's actually this thriving and alive ecological system that's below our feet and that in order to have a thriving, beautiful, abundant garden, we need to focus on the soil and to really encourage it to thrive and be alive in and of itself. And so um, we were talking about um, nematodes, for example, um, on the call today with these young refugee kids. And they were saying, okay, so what we're doing is we're making this natural pesticide, we have this problem and we're going to treat it with this solution. And so that's kind of what we normally think of. But what that means is you have this direct corrective and it's this fight that you're in. Whereas actually, if you th if nematodes, when you see plants being affected by nematodes, what happens is that they lose their vitality and you can see that they're sort of not really, they're not flourishing, they're not being able to draw up nutrients and moisture. And so you can see in your garden where there's a nematode problem because all the plants look a little bit stunted and they're not really growing so well. But the problem is you don't go and attack the nematode because the thing is that there's all different sorts of nematodes. There's good nematodes and there's nematodes that affect your plants. And actually nematodes are some of the things which help to feed other soil life. They help to break down all the organic matter and, and create plant food. And so if you try and kill one thing, you kill all the good stuff as well. So really what you're trying to do is to enhance the vitality of soil life as a whole. An interesting thing about the nematode conversation too is that it's the good nematodes, good nematodes that eat the other ones. So if you create a balance, then um, your problems can, can dissipate. So the key thing is actually about nurturing this soil life. And the best thing to do with that is adding compost and adding mulch and organic matter. And it's, it sounds so simple, but this is the foundation for everything because that, if you think about feeding the soil life, and then the soil life feeds, feeds the plants and then the plants feed us. So the healthier our soil is, the healthier we are. So I do lots of different things from a whole range of different composting systems to a whole range of different worm farming systems and super simple. So I don't know if you can see that little tower there. I have all these little worm towers in my garden and it's actually having worm farms in the garden beds themselves. So I go and feed the worms in the garden and then they process the materials and that just goes straight into the garden bed and the other soil organisms come in, take it out and spread it around. So I'm not having to do the digging and the spreading and the separating and all that work. I, I engage the life in my garden to do that job for me. Um, and mulching is that really important thing to do in our world, particularly with all the heat and, and heavy rains and all different things that we experience in those subtropics that mulch is so important. Um, this, this is actually uh, in the middle there. This is my son holding some worms from our worm farm. And he created this little worm farming enterprise to when he was about eight, I think, and to actually sell worm towers at our local market. And I was showing him how to separate worms out of a worm farm. And, you know, hey, you mound up, you tip out your worm farm and you mound it up and you scrape away the, the worm castings and the worms go away from the light and heat into the middle and you get this massive great mound of worms in the middle. And after a couple of times doing that, he says, oh, you know, mum, there's got to be an easier way. And this, this is taking too long. And so he said, I've got an idea. And what he did was he said, I'm going to get the worms to come to me. So we got a funnel from the kitchen, raced into the kitchen, got a funnel, stuck it in the worm farm, filled it up with food and walked away. Came back a couple of days later and lo and behold, all the worms had come in into the funnel and started eating that food. And this is, this is how you do it. <laughs> and you can do the same sort of thing, you know, by putting an avocado or an apple or something that the worms love. And so, you know, I really loved his thinking because he saw it differently. I was teaching one particular way and that's what I was saying before, you know, different perspectives give you different ways. So nurturing soil life. And there's one other thing that I wanted to mention about the soil life just now. I mean, you could talk forever just about soil, but um, the one thing that I want to say about the simple way of composting too um, many of you might have those standard compost bins with that have the hole in the bottom and you know the little plastic recycled plastic bin kind of like a well, a Dalek looking thing so often we stick those in the back corner of the garden and we go and take food scraps to it and then when it's kind of finished we lift it off we scoop all the, the, the compost and we take that somewhere else well what I like to suggest is we actually um, don't move the stuff we move the bin 
So you look around your garden and look to where the garden is lacking in, in nutrients and you stick the bin there and then you fill it up, make your compost there and then you lift it off, spread it out, mulch over the top of it, that's a garden. Move the bin somewhere else. Maybe you want a fruit tree here, maybe you want a fresh garden there. there. So it's this idea of doing in situ composting and moving the bin rather than wheelbarrowing the compost around. So little ideas like that just help to, to, to make your life a bit easier. Now, another thing that really makes your life easier too is creating habitat for all the species which contribute to your garden. Everything gardens, as they say. So, um, you know, making sure that you have habitat, of course, for pollinators. Um, so one of the things I like to have all through my garden are things like this um, perennial basil. And when my daughter was about four, she called, she renamed that in our garden, the bee bush, because it's always flowering different from the standard sweet basil which you know the, what we've trained been trained to do is to snip off the flower head so we get more leaf for the culinary purposes in this one here you don't snip off the flowers you want the flowers to come and they they're there all year round and in in actual fact you can eat the flowers and you can eat the seeds and you can eat these leaves as well um, but the thing here is that they are attracting the pollinators into a garden which is so important um, which makes all the difference but I also like to attract uh, lots of birds into the garden. And I mean, what are the other things that eat pests? What are things, you know, um, lizards and frogs and lots of things come in and help to eat the bugs, which could cause problems. I actually watch as um, the little birds come into my garden and they'll hide in a bush, something like this sacred basil, because they're kind of a bit twiggy. They'll come in, they'll hide in there and they'll dart out. They'll grab hold of the side of the kale, dance up, peck off things and then back into the little bush on the side. And so there's this beautiful relationship between these shrubs and that are scattered through and create this protected habitat for these little birds and, and the garden. And it's about embracing all that. So if we enclose things too much or if we sort of have things to scare away things, we, we miss this opportunity of building a relationship. Um, it's also kind of interesting to try and work out how you can build relationships with things that are challenging. And, and that's, that's something, you know, for example, when I first came here, kangaroos and wallabies, trying to work out how to work with them was always a little bit interesting. Um, I've worked out to put the things that they don't like to eat on the edges of the pathways and it sort of deflects them. And I've worked out where they like to travel. This is the kangaroos and I've made a path for them through the middle of the garden. And then on the edges of the kangaroo path, I've got things they don't like to eat. So they don't tend to venture further than that. And along the edge of the walkway, the, the wallabies used to eat all my sweet potatoes. And so I've actually put them on the edge so that they'll go along and eat them along the edge of the terrace, but not bother to get up into the actual garden itself. And so they're kind of trimming for me. They're doing a job for me, but they're not eating all of my produce. So it's about really trying to work with nature in the garden and create habitat for all those things. So, you know, lizards and frogs are so important as well. And so you need a bit of wildness. You need the shrubs, you need the perennials, you need the, um, the little bowls of water and the and the um the little bit of uh, yeah like i said wildness not everything kind of neat and in its place because we won't get that diversity that we need as well now a really important thing that i always like to think of when i'm starting a garden particularly a permaculture kind of garden is how can i get as much biomass growing as quickly as possible so i can be getting a lot of materials i can make my compost you know make my mulches help to improve the soil create a microclimate activate the whole system now one of those is this comfrey which is on the on the left um, comfrey is the main plant that i use I, I i use it to grow and make my own natural fertilizer for example i also use it to add in and activate compost um, I use it around the edges of gardens to be a weed barrier. Um, I, I think I said I make a liquid fertilizer. Yeah, liquid fertilizer, um, the compost on the edges. Um, but also I gather the leaves and add it in when I'm making a no dig garden too. And another thing I do is plant it around the edges of fruit trees because they have deep roots that go down, collect all the nutrients and moisture and bring them up into the, into the surface. And then I use them just to naturally um, be 
uh, a living mulch around a fruit tree and the things seem to thrive. Now in the middle here is, is a plant which uh, is called edible canna or Queensland arrowroot. And the reason I grow this one was, uh, again, many reasons, but um, it grows so fast that it creates this beautiful, luscious structure into the garden, <clears throat> excuse me, that can create a microclimate. It can provide shade from afternoon sun. It has lots of material I can chop and drop and use it to add in and around fruit trees. And it has these edible, um, you can see the, the bulbous bases at the bottom. That's kind of like my subtropical potato. And the thing about this that I really love is that you actually don't need to dig up the whole potato, the whole plant. What you do is you just go along and you just snap off one of the edges, one of the ones that's just got a little shoot out of it and leave what I call the mother plant in there and you just keep snapping that off. So it, it's staying there in the garden. And what happens when you leave these sorts of plants in the garden, they start to create this, this living um, uh, community underneath the ground. If you keep plugging and pulling and digging and chopping, it, it, it has to start from scratch. The whole soil ecology has to reorganize its home. When you have perennials like this that stay there, they're kind of like, they inoculate the rest of the soil. So if you disturb this bit here, as long as you've got perennials there, it can very quickly just re-inhabit um, what's going on. So I, I really like these plants because they help, like I said, to give me lots of biomass and lots of material for doing um, composting and mulching. Now, I don't know what I would do in my garden if I didn't have things that were self-seeding. So once the soil is, is kind of ready to receive seeds, I rely on self-seeding plants so much. So for example, I've actually stopped planting tomatoes because I always get, without even trying, these cherry tomatoes. They just grow on their own. And I'm sure any of you gardeners would know that too. And I so instead of going, oh, all I'm getting is cherry tomatoes, I wish I had other ones, I'm actually going, well, actually, I get cherry tomatoes without even trying, and they seem to be really healthy. They don't get so many pests or problems as other ones, and they pick when to grow and where to grow, which kind of tells me that it's the right time for them and in the right place for them. And so I just stake them up where they are, or actually sometimes even leaving them just ramble at the bottom of a, of a fruit tree somewhere, is a really good thing. I can remove them if they're in the wrong spot and maybe dig them with some soil and take them to another spot that I want them. But they've seeded at the time that's perfect for them in the environment that's perfect for them. So I take note of that. Um, the other thing is that the, the um, cherry tomatoes seem to have quite a bit of a, th a thicker skin, which means that they don't get bitten quite so much as other tomatoes do. And they're the closest to the wild tomatoes that we have in our kind of tomato family. Um, and so they're very robust and resilient um, to all different sorts of things. Now the one on the right is mustard spinach, which is another plant that I've not planted for, gosh, I don't even remember how long either. And I've got all different sorts. I've got frilly edge ones, I've got um, these green ones, I've got purple ones. And they, um, often people think, oh, they're a bit annoying because they go to seed so quickly. What happens is that as they're going to seed, they have this sort of flexible seed stalk and you can harvest that. And that's like a spicy asparagus. So I eat that and you can keep taking that as long as it keeps coming up. And uh, if you miss it, it'll go up further and then you'll start to get flowers. But don't worry, because then you can eat the flowers. I mean, so these young leaves are edible, the little florets are edible, the stalks are edible, the flowers are edible. And then when it gets little seed pods after it's flowered, the young ones, they're edible. They're like little mini spicy peas, which are quite delicious. And then once the pea, uh, once they dry, then uh, you can open them up and inside there's the little black seeds, mustard seeds, and then you can make your own mustard. It's such a fantastic thing. And this plant self seeds so readily. And I use it as a leafy green in all different sorts of things, from fresh as a salad to a stir fry to soups and casseroles, anything. And the other thing that I, I don't remember the last time I planted it was um, pumpkin. So I have pumpkins surrounding uh, my house at the moment. They've decided to come on this side of the garden and I've let them go and I have pumpkins all the time. And anyone who knows me has heard me rave on about pumpkins because what I didn't know when I first got started gardening was that every single part of the pumpkin is edible. I always assumed that, you know, it was just the pumpkin. And I grew up in a household where, you know, my dad was a super 
um, and he still is, he's a super pumpkin soup maker, but he always took off the skin and scooped out the seeds and, you know, and chucked all that away. I mean, into the compost, which is okay. But you can, all the skin, all the seeds are edible. So now I just chop the whole thing up, and just to take off the stalk, toss it in the pot. It's all edible. The seeds give you extra protein. The skin gives you extra phytonutrients. And as you cook them up, and they soften and it's fantastic. Um, but also all the leaves and the shoots and the flowers. And actually, even the immature fruits, um, I eat those as a zucchini alternative. So sometimes when you're having problems, particularly in this climate, with, you know, sooty mold or something like that, for your zucchinis, you can just duck down to your pumpkin vine and take a couple of the young ones. And there you've got uh, something that tastes just like that. And we often don't think about eating an immature pumpkin. A zucchini is an immature type of marrow of the same family that it's all edible and all the leaves are edible. And, and I learned about eating the leaves when I was in, in Korea because they have these beautiful tables laid out with so, so many different sort of vegetables and tofus and dip sauces and all sorts of things. And there was these big leaves in the middle and they'd pick one up and they'd take lots of different bits and put all the vegetables in, wrap them up and then dip them in a dipping sauce. And I, and I thought, gosh, that looks a lot like a pumpkin leaf. And it was. And it never struck me to eat it. I'd always walk past that. And once you see that, and you can't unsee it, now when you look at a pumpkin vine, you're going to say, see so much abundance. And actually, one of the things I think that's really important about this is acknowledging that there's so much more food in our gardens that we ever even think possible just by, and we can do that just by shifting our perception about what is food and what's edible. Okay. So, um, Part, so self-seeding and also perennializing your garden. Perennializing, and what I mean by that is adding in plants. You don't have to plant and pull, plant and pull each season. And so the one in the middle is one that I love because it's just always there and it's Brazilian spinach. Uh, so these leaves, um, I, and I often call it sort of my happy spinach plant because it doesn't matter what the weather's like, it's always standing up nice and straight and firm and it's shiny. And so it looks good, whereas other spinaches have sort of flopped over and look a bit dull if it's really dry. So that I love. And there's other ones. There's one in the corner you can just see, which is the Suriname spinach there. Um, in the picture beside on the right, you can see some of the cranberry hibiscus with edible leaves. Um, but there's also lots of other things in there, like the um, pineapple sage, which, is, uh, which you can make teas out of. And there's a little um, pomegranate tree just tucked in the corner there that you can't see very well. But did you know that actually the leaves, the young leaves of a pomegranate tree are also edible as a green? I've, I made a whole series of little videos um, during COVID about all these sorts of different kind of edible plants. And um, you might want to check them out on the, on the YouTube. I'll, the link I put up in the, um, in the root there. Um, I'm sorry, I just saw it. <laughs> arrow root. I was looking at the chat and I, it went into my brain. In the chat, I put the link to the top to my YouTube channel. Um, and it, uh, so during COVID, when it was really challenging to actually get seeds or seedlings uh, here in Australia, and I'm pretty sure it was in many other parts of the world too, there was a big rush on them all. I did this series of 55 um, films, each one each day, about different things you can eat in your garden. So they're all now available on YouTube in just a few minutes each. You might want to sort of duck into those and find out some of the more unusual things that you, you can actually eat. Um, and the other thing I'm talking about that I've put kale here is the perenni to perennialize that because while often it gets grown as an annual, it can last years. I've got some in my garden that have been there, for, I don't know, several years now. Um, they go through phases of looking a little bit eaten, but then they come back again. And sometimes they even throw off little shoots off the side. And I'm known to sort of go in and just gently slice those off and plant those somewhere else. So you have these, these plants that you often think as just being annuals that you can keep going. And the longer you leave them in, the deeper their root system and more connected it is to the whole soil life. That means that they can draw in moisture and nutrients um, beautifully. So uh, another really important thing that I think is so useful is growing as much mulch as you can. So I grow lots of things. Like I showed you already the comfrey, which I use as a mulch, um, the, the arrowroot, the Queensland arrowroot or the canna edulis, that I use as a mulch. Things like pigeon pea as well. 
um, but lemongrass is great. So this is here just when it starts to brown off and often, uh, you know, people think, oh, it looks really ratty. At that point, I just chop it right back to about this high and then all new shoots will start to come back, grab all of that and toss it around all the fruit trees and um, it's, it's brilliant. Now, and on the picture on the, on the right here, I also do sort of successional mulching and it's a little bit like Fukuoka, if you've ever read One Straw Revolution, you know, he just, one crop would go down, he just planted the next, another crop would go down, he just keep planting like this. And so the organic matter was building and he wasn't even pulling out the roots of things because actually if you leave some of the root material to die back um, in, the, in the soil, it breaks down into beautiful organic matter and then it creates holes that moisture and nutrients can, can actually infiltrate into the soil. So, so for example, here, when the pumpkins had finished, I just kind of like loaded them all up into a spot and then I would um, plug something else into that. And for example, recently, um, when there was some corns that had finished, I laid them down and then I poked some broad beans in between the corns. And then when the broad beans are finished and I've harvested that, they'll go down and I'll plug something else in. So you just keep growing your own mulch. So whatever it is that's growing in your garden, how can you make that part of your mulch? Because it's kind of expensive to go and buy mulch from somewhere else. And sometimes when we bring mulch in too, um, it can contain seeds and, and uh, things that can come into your garden that you don't necessarily want. And, and um, we're in the middle of plastic free July um, month right now. And, you know, often the mulch bags, you know, obviously are plastic unless we get those, um, the, the bare bales, which, Still have plastic ties on them, but I also do find those plastic ties um, brilliant. Some of those plastic ties I've had for years and years and years, they last so long. Um, I made a, a bamboo uh, structure for my chickens, to, like a roost for them. And it's all strapped up with the baling twine from, from hay bales, which is, so just being a bit sort of uh, thinking about how you can use all different things. Now, a key thing as well, I think is, in, in terms of growing a really thriving and abundant garden is picking plants that are really hardy. And I really learned this lesson a lot when I would go away doing work internationally and I'd be away for maybe three months, six months. There was one time I was away for nine months and I came back and I went out to my garden and tried to see, okay, well, what is, what's growing there? I've done nothing in the garden for nine months. I've not planted, I've not weeded, I've not watered. There's been no automatic system running. What's still growing? And it was those plants which I identified then as being the what I would call now the skeleton of my garden. And these are often things like the kales and the cranberry hibiscus and the society garlics and, and the cannas and the comfries and all those sorts of plants which provide Brazilian spinaches. They're there regardless of what I do. And so they're always something that I can rely on to have food. And then if there's a good season, I can interplant it with things, a cooler season, I'll do the cool things. But there's always this structure. There's something edible in the garden. And it shifts from being often what becomes a, like a fight in the garden to be a peaceful way of garden because they grow whatever the season is. They're so robust and resilient and drought tolerant and, and pest resistant and all these sorts of things. Um, that I find it just makes, well, it makes my gardening anyway far more enjoyable and, um, and an easier task to create um, an abundance. And I talked a little bit about flowers before, but I think it's a really important thing to have as a key point, but to just have flowers everywhere. And I'm not talking about just filling it up with ornamentals for ornamental sake. I mean, most of the flowers that, that I have in my garden are edible flowers or medicinal flowers. And so I'm... Oops, Sorry, um, I make, you know, I make, you know, and we get little posies of of um, plants, uh, of flowers from the from the garden um, for the table, and there's, most of them are edible, and I add them into salads and all different things too, and it attracts the beneficial insects, and it makes the garden look so much more colourful and beautiful, and this might seem a simple little statement. But it makes all the difference, I think, because often I've seen a lot of people who start gardens, they have this great big wave of enthusiasm and then for some reason they just stop doing it and there's, there's these abandoned gardens at the back. And, and I think actually one of the things that keeps us engaged in the garden is if we 
just do that simple little thing of eating something from it every day. Even if all it is that we can find in there is some herbs for a garnish or a, you know, a few leaves of this or that, then it keeps us connected. It takes us out into the garden. It, it, it helps us to connect with the seasons and what's going on and to what's known. The first principle of permaculture is to observe and interact. And so get out into our garden and make sure that even if it's just a little bit that we eat from our garden every day. And it also helps us to, to sort of shift our perception about being just a consumer to being a producer as well. And I mentioned too about eating more of, of plants, but there's so many things that we overlook. I mentioned the pumpkins, but sweet potato, we can eat uh, all of the sweet potato plant too. So the sweet potato greens are a key green that I eat. I mean, even if all you have is the balcony, you can even stick a sweet potato from the shop in a pot, hanging a hanging pot and allow the tendrils to come down and you can be snipping those off and putting those into your, into your, um, well, you can actually put them into smoothies or uh, you can eat them raw as well as cooking them. I prefer cooking them, but they are actually totally fine to eat raw. Um, you know, um, all the um, broccoli leaves are totally edible, uh, cauliflower leaves, um, the beetroot leaves, um, radish leaves, all these different leaves of plants. We often think that it's just the vegetable that we can eat. Um, I, one of the plants that I was talking about um, during COVID was actually eating some tomato leaves and most, most of us would never even think about doing that. So I really encourage you to check out some of those videos. So eat more of each plant and then also involve others. And, um, you know, I love gardening with other people because I learn so much. I learn so much when I'm sitting beside someone else and you know, you're not necessarily going to a class, but you're in the garden, you're doing something together. So inviting people over to do some work in the garden with you or going down to a community garden and getting involved. And, um, and then also working with a bunch of kids. It's so exciting to get kids into the garden. I often run little um, nature kids programs here in my garden and, and um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And also um, high school students too. So I, I run little permaculture camps. But there's great programs like permablitz programs where you can, you know, everyone can go over to your house one, one week and then the next week or next month, everyone goes to another person's house. And so the person's house it is provides, you know, the resources for the job and maybe some food for people and then you go around to someone else's place and so you're learning different techniques and ideas as well as getting big jobs done that you can't do by yourself so it makes it kind of fun doing all of that um so i just wanted to let you know of a few resources that are available um that are really that are free resources that you can access so i have a monthly newsletter that goes out um, and I think when you subscribe to it, I hope this works. If it doesn't, um, you can always email me via Kate. There's a, there's a little booklet that goes with this talk and you can access that um, through there. So um, that's ourpermaculturelife.com. And I put the link to the blog up in the top of the group chat and you'll see a subscribe button there. Um, then during Plastic Free July, I'm going online every day at four o'clock on my on my Facebook, um, which is Our Permaculture Life. And so these are some of the things. So, I, you know, all the different things you can use to grow, um, to uh, use for salads, uh, how to grow a tea garden. Um, you can see all these different things, like just simple things you, you can do to get rid of um, plastic in your life. Uh, so that's that one. Um, oh, and during Plastic Free July, I'm actually offering a free course as well. So if you... Uh, I can send you the link to that as well. So if you wanted to follow the Plastic Free July, there'll be some information there soon too about how to sign up to win the course. Um, this is the blog. So there's about 400 articles you can dive in. So you, the little, you can see the search bar there. So if there's a plant that you wanted to find out information about or compost or worms or something like that, pop it in the search and you'll be able to find so, so many resources that are available in there. And that there's information, there's recipes, there's films, all sorts of things. So take a look at that. Um, and also a, a YouTube channel. And I think there's well over, there's all, close to 200 films available in there now as well. So uh, again, about plants or touring different gardens or conversations. Um, I'm also including up there, um, a new podcast I'm doing. So a recent one was with David Holmgren, who is a co-originator of permaculture. Um, 
I have a, a free little four part series on permaculture that you can access. I'm just going to put the link here in the chat because I haven't done that. Um, and so that just sort of describes what permaculture is and how you can kind of weave it into your life and your livelihood too. Uh, four part series. I've just put that into the chat. Um, every month I do a masterclass. So it's a one, uh, one hour masterclass on a different topic that, that the community chooses. So um, something similar to this, but a bit more, a um, bit longer. So it's an hour uh, and so there's people from around the world who join that and um, sometimes, well, usually as well over 2,000 people who, who register for that. So if you'd like to join in, um, sign up to the newsletter and you'll hear about that too. If you have young people between the ages of 11 and 16, um, please let them know about Perma Youth. Uh, this is a group that uh, not only enjoys camps in and around Southeast Queensland, um, but they have a global network now. So every Sunday they get together and they talk permaculture. Um, they're learning together. And uh, there's, there's kids from Zanzibar. There's kids from a refugee camp in Uganda. There's kids from England and um, Germany, Philippines, Thailand, all getting together and talking about uh, living sustainably and, um, and how to grow food. And so it's absolutely fantastic. And even they're getting things like... Um, pen pals with the with the refugee kids and um, they're raising money to help fund the refugee kids to get their gardens happening and things like that so if you've got young people grandkids kids people you know down the street who've got young people who are 11 to 16 um, you can always send them my way and I would love to connect them up with that um, I mentioned that I've started a podcast just to, um, on World Environment Day which is the 5th of June so I've now got uh, five episodes up there um, so it's called Sense Making and Changing World. And you can find, yeah, so uh, just, you may well have heard of Linda Woodrow who wrote um, The Permaculture Home Garden. She was my guest uh, this week. Uh, she's just put out a new book, a novel, actually, the first novel that has permaculture as the foundation for it. So that's very cool. Um, uh, also, I run a, something called a per, uh, Ethos Foundation, which is a permaculture charity. And basically, um, I let people know about projects like the, the Perma Youth in the refugee camps or uh, women's self-help groups and people don't name, donate money to the charity and I just send it straight over to them. So I don't take out any admin costs or anything. I just send it straight across. So we're trying to raise money at the moment for um, the women's, the grandmother's group to set up a demonstration permaculture garden education centre and also for each of the refugee kids in the Perma Youth Club to have their own set of tools and seeds so they can have a community garden, but also go back and make um, guard, food gardens in and around their tents. They're sort of, they make huts out of the UNHCR sort of banners and things. And it's such an important thing right now because um, during lockdown, they've been getting half rations. And so actually having kitchen gardens is the most critical thing. Uh, so I also run a, a permaculture teachers course and um, I don't know why that picture's in there. Sorry, it was meant to be that one. <laughs> um, yeah, so I got so many different resources that are available to people if they wanted to follow more and find out more about permaculture or just to dive in to learn out more about plants. And I'm really happy to, to um, field any questions now about any of the things I've talked about or to, if someone has a particular question about permaculture that they would like to, uh, to ask. Um, I'm just stop sharing my screen. Morag, I've just um, copied and pasted some of your links in again, but some of the other links you talked about, have you added those to the chat box as well? They're right at the very top, ourpermaculturelife.com. And then the huge, I'm, I'll just copy them and, and paste I've, them down the bottom again. Okay, I've just, just in case them. they're not. Oh, all you the, have done that. Okay. Yeah, Great, all those other you. links you talked about, the master classes um your charity are they all on your website as well yeah i'll just put the charity in now because i don't think that's necessarily there um but whenever there's a master class coming up i'll let people know through sort of my newsletter so if you're on my newsletter a monthly newsletter you'll hear about all that kind of stuff yeah but and i'll just put the newsletter on these links uh yeah so if you go to um our permaculturelife.com 
um, that was the blog that I showed. And up the top, it says subscribe. And you just click that and you can put your name in there. Um, let me see. Um, ethosfoundation.org.au is the permaculture charity. If anybody else has got questions, I had a question earlier. You talked a lot about healthy vegetable gardens um, and you talked a lot about mulch and using comfrey and, and, and some of your own um, produce, some of your own um, vegetables to, to mulch. Um, if you had to buy mulch, what would your preferred type of mulch be? Um, the, first, the first sort that I would buy would be I'd try and find like there's a depends where you are really like i i do a collective buy with people here and to a local farmer so we just get some local grass hay and we know that it's from a paddock that hasn't been sprayed and and he kind of you know he it's really great we know that it doesn't have lots of seeds and things in it but if you if you have to buy it in a in a local you know in a store you know in your in the middle of a city or something probably something like the organic sugar cane is probably the best bet for you but as quickly as possible you can start to grow your own mulch with a lot of those sort of plants that i mentioned and that's by far the best and the most affordable and um, the, you know, the most regenerative way of actually doing gardening. Now, Stuart's got a, mess, a question here. Do you have recommendations for shaded areas? Yeah, shaded areas. You know, um, if it's super shady, that's kind of challenging for a lot of edible plants. But if it's just reasonably shady and it gets some sun during the day, a lot of your leafy green type salads and and um, vegetables can actually manage on on a small amount of light less than less than other things that are the sort of the fruiting type of vegetables so that would be something that I would you know tend towards or herbs you know a lot of herbs could possibly do with a little less so I would go for those there's a question here from Raylene about best plant for windbreaks near the beach southerly and westerly winds um, I, you know what I do when I'm looking for wind, for windbreaks? I go to my local land care nursery and I talk to the local land care person about what are the plants, which are the ones that have quite dense small leaves that go all the way down, you know, so, and there's all different sorts of plants you can get, you know, that, um, and some will grow fast and some will grow slow. So I actually often have a, a sort of a multi-pronged approach. There might be something that I'll grow really rapidly to get that windbreak happening quickly. And even as, as much, you know, in some places I've even grown up, um, you know, canna or lemongrass or something like as a little in-garden windbreak while my main windbreak is getting established. And I will start with something like an acacia that grows really fast a wattle. It's not a long-term thing. I will grow it up and keep chopping it back as mulch until the other things that come through. So it's a successional approach. So the main ones that you want, your longer lasting, take longer to grow, but you can have things in the middle. So, you know, maybe, you know, uh, I don't know, casuarina is a really fantastic windbreaks, but um, it depends where you are. You may not have the space for those because they're big trees. Uh, is Bamboo, good as mulch. Well, I use bamboo leaves in and around um, areas all the time. Probably, I don't use it so much in my veggie garden because I find them a little, the leaves are a little bit irritating on my fingers. Um, and it depends. You may be a glove gardener. I'm not a glove gardener. I just like to garden with my hands and stick my hands in the soil and feel how moist it is. But so I would use bamboo in and around, um, you know, some of the native areas or even throw it in and around, um, you know, fruit trees or mix it in with a compost as a part of the blend of that as a, like a high carbon material. Um, we have clay level to about a foot down under a house. It's really hard to get through. How do we quickly break down? Um, so the clay level, you know, I, I think the thing is just to start building and adding the organic matter and starting to 
um, have some deep rooted plants that go down. Things like the comfries, really deep rooting will help to break open things. And even things like um, daikon radish has been known to help sort of get in and sort of start to prise things open. But perennial plants, you know, um, plants, shrubs and things that would find their way down deeper. So the idea would be to try and um, just, and also to build up so that you get more life in the soil. So then the life will start to open it up as well. You'll get worms going down and other soil organisms. So rather, um, the, the best thing is always, always to be adding more and more organic matter on top, and then the soil life will start to take it down. It will start to build better structure in the soil. And that works whether you have a really sandy soil or whether you have a really clay soil as well. How do I get rid of disease? Oh, hang on, sorry. Um, planted some canna, have a public footpath. Great, excellent. Um, how do I get rid of diseased plants? Well, it kind of depends what the disease is. Um, sometimes uh, if it's a really bad one, you might need to burn it. Sometimes if you, um, you know, you can toss it into, you know, you can just, Sometimes the disease is not going to get onto every plant. It might just affect, uh, you know, uh, something that's another vegetable. But if you take it and mulch it up around underneath your natives, it's not going to be a problem at all. So you're still adding it back into the soil, but just somewhere else that's away from your vegetables. So we need to put the problem in context as well. Often we sort of see the problem and think it's completely a problem, but it's only in that place that it's a problem. Um, where can I get some comfrey, please? In Brisbane. Oh gosh, Northy Street City Farm has an edible landscapes nursery or any kind of um, community garden has probably got some and I'm sure they'll give you a cutting would be the way to go. Um, how do you work with bush turkeys and still have a garden? That's a good question. I'm sure many of you have got responses to this as well. Um, if anyone has any good ideas, um, chuck, in, chuck those responses in that because you know, there's so many different ways. Um, oh gosh, lots of different things from having overlaying um, material, like lots of sticks on the ground, or sometimes having like little, uh, what we were doing down at Northy Street, we'd have little fences around the garden. And so they would stop them from scratching the material, the material out. I just visited a friend of mine. He has these sort of plastic mulch material or there's a I used to use wire wire netting on the ground I also use that for chickens to stop them scratching so much so you can put that over the top of, of mulch material um, so it's just a bit of um, messing around and finding the best ways I you know some people like to then raise their gardens up so that they can't do it but I still find that unless you have those other sort of strategies they'll still get in there um, so um, and also I much prefer um, having gardens in the ground because they don't get dried out quite so much in particularly in our hot and dry times they don't need so much water and also they can they they uh, what I find is when you have little separate garden beds you don't get so much of the soil life thriving quite as much as if you have it in the ground or connected up in a big community gosh there's some good um, comments um, mildew on squash um, what to do about that? Well, um, sometimes it just comes in as part of the season when it gets, you know, when it's a wet time. Also, if you water at night time, it could do that. Maybe there's not so enough air in and around it to allow it to dry out a bit. Um, you know, what I find is when, the, when, you know, we are susceptible to that here, that, you know, I tend to just get get to a point with, with things like squash and go, okay, well, that's the end of its life um, and not try and fight it. Uh, depends on how far it's gone. Maybe if it's just on one leaf, you can remove that leaf and, and take that and put it, like I was saying, somewhere else. Uh, so you manage it for a while, but eventually I find that they do actually just succumb to that. Um, what do you use to get dirt right out of your hands? I've read soil. And so it's hard not to work without gloves. Um, I don't know, I always seem to have dirt kind of cake somewhere on my hands <laughs> deeply into the crevices. And, um, but, uh, you know, often if you, um, I have that, that salve that you, I don't know if you noticed in the picture, that was a, it was a calendula salve um, that I made. You can actually use that on your hands before you go into the garden. It just helps to prevent it from 
getting in as as much as well so i i do that um i don't know i i'm not particularly fussy about my hands maybe i should be more (laughs) I also go barefoot as well. You should see my feet. (laughs) Oh, no, I'm not going to show you my feet. This was photo to Sophie Thompson a few weeks ago, and she just said, embrace the dirt in your hands and be proud of it. Yeah. Yeah, do you know, Anna? Washing your hair, because I I know that's that's also a good way to get a lot of the dirt out of your hands. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that's right. You know, washing your hair, it actually gets the dirt out from underneath your fingernails. Um, but you know, I do like to, I do like to, um, have bare feet when I'm gardening too. There's something about my feet, um, my, um, they, they sense the temperature, the moisture, the softness, the aliveness. I can feel the soil through my feet. They're kind of like an instrument. When you, when you have your feet encapsulated in boots, you get, you don't have any sense of that. You don't feel the warmth of the soil, whether it's, you know, you get to know, oh, no, it's not quite ready for that, that series of plants yet. It's still the cool time or, oh, this feels a bit dry and hard here. I, you know, I actually need to work on this bit a bit more. And it's, it's such an important part of how I garden, actually, the f- feeling it with my hands and my feet. And it's such an important part. Of so um, it's one of the things that I get on, the, on my YouTube channel with the comments quite a lot is, you know, put some shoes on. <laughs> Anyway, well, not in that part. Of, no, we're not in the middle of my garden. No, that's right. Um, let's see. Rub hands with rosemary branches. Oh, that's very nice. Is there something safe to coat timber to protect it? Compost base. Mm. I, I don't tend to coat any of my timber with anything if I'm doing that kind of work. I, I would, you know, often I might have, like if I'm using pallets, I actually have like pallets and tin as part of my timber or some, you know, I go and find some old, old um, posts of some sort that are really old and hard and weathered and, and use those sorts of things rather than coating them. Um, yeah, I wouldn't like to tread in duck poo either, but I, I don't have ducks, but I look out for my chooks. We did have ducks a while ago, and yeah, they leave duck poo all over the, all over the veranda. <laughs> They're gorgeous, though. They, do. they love the warmth. All right, I can't see any more, any more questions in there, and I see that we're just about to get to the hour. So we are. Um, We've I'm not sure. Over. We've had so many questions. Um, Maura, gosh, you're so inspiring, of course, and us avid gardeners could could talk gardens and and practice gardens all day and all night i think but look there's you you packed a lot into that 45 minutes or an hour um there's just always so much more to know look you are coming you are coming to the botanical bazaar on the 4th of october and please you know if you're not doing anything that weekend it's the long weekend in october please come and join us on the gold coast um, visit our Facebook page, Botanical Botanical Bazaar. We'd love to see you there. You do need to buy the tickets online because we do have to 